Hello and welcome to this lecture series on the prelude to the revolution. We're going to begin by just discussing localism and nationalism. Localism was and still is today a major component of American culture. And it's very easy to see this. I mean, think about it. How many times when you're asked where you're from, you tend to gravitate towards the city you're from or maybe even the state you're from, right? You don't sit there and say, well, I'm from America, especially if you're in America, right? It seems a little bit strange to do that. But at the same time, localism has existed side by side through most of American history with another equally important component, nationalism. And you can bring that out too, right? How many times do you root for Team USA? At that point, you're not thinking in localist terms. Politically, we do have a tendency as Americans to think nationally, right? We know who the president is, but maybe we don't know who the, the uh, mayor of our own town is, right? So you can kind of see both of these things drawn out. So in order for us to really understand how we got to revolution in the United States, we have to kind of explore localism, nationalism in a little bit more detail. So let's take a look at the definition of localism. By definition, it is the conviction that local concerns and local interests and local loyalties are more significant and command a higher loyalty than national concerns, interests, and goals. Now, from a political standpoint, that is a key tenet of the idea of the decentralization of power. And we can see examples of this in colonial history where this decentralization of power, this localist sentiment, is going to have a very strong effect on how the people react when there's an effort made or an attempt made to centralize power. For example, when James, the Duke of York, became King James II, he thought it would be a good idea to consolidate his holdings, New York, with all those little tiny New England colonies that bordered it. To him, it makes absolute sense. You combine these small colonies together and place them under a single royal governor. So he does that. He combines New York, New Jersey with Connecticut, Plymouth, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island, and he creates what's called the Dominion of New England. Places it under a single royal governor, a guy by the name of Edmund Andros, who he sends to Boston along with a couple thousand troops to help establish this new, uh, uh, this new political order. Now, from his mind's eye, this is all going to be fine. So he's probably pretty shocked when the colonists revolted, right? But it really makes sense when you think about it. I mean, the colonists, when you think about it, there's a reason why Connecticut broke away from Massachusetts and Rhode Island broke away from Massachusetts. Do you really think that they want to be lumped back in with these people? They don't, right? They see themselves from a very localist point of view. So they don't necessarily see themselves as Englishmen. They see themselves as... Um, you know, Massachusetts and Rhode Islanders and I don't know what you would call a Connecticut, a Connecticut, I don't know, right? So they see themselves from a very localist view. Now, the significance of this then is that it kind of showed us a couple of things. First of all, it showed that England and the Crown and Parliament, for that matter, do not really understand the political realities of the American colonies. And we're going to see this as we move forward. We're going to see more and more examples of this. They really don't understand how the colonies are working compared to back there in England. And second, it demonstrated that strength of localism in America. These guys really did see themselves as separate entities and really took offense of trying to be lumped together. So it really makes you wonder, how the heck did we ever United States, right? You know, if all of these colonies that were founded at different times for vastly different reasons right, uh, um, see themselves as so different from each other, how is it that we ever combined together and collectively rose up against the crown and, you know, and fought for our independence? Well, that comes from uh, the United States uh, uh, manifestation of a growing sense of American nationalism. And the key word there is American nationalism. When these guys start to develop a nationalist sentiment, it's not English nationalism, right? It's not to the crown. It's to the American continent, right? American nationalism. So what is nationalism? Let's go ahead and define that. Nationalism is a state in mind which the supreme loyalty of the individual is given over to the nation state as opposed to any other group of which the individual is a member, right? This is thinking broader, 
Okay, and in order for this to happen, you need to have five prerequisites and two stressors. And so I'll go over those next. So there's five components that you have to have, prerequisites, in order to start to have even a chance of developing some kind of national identity, right? First, you have to have some kind of common heritage, right? You have to have some heritage, some kind of history together that uh, uh, gives you a that you can draw a sense of unity from, right? Second, you need a common language. Obviously, if you cannot communicate, you're going to have a di difficulty uh, developing a sense of national identity. And so you have to have this common language, or at least predominantly a common language, in order for that to happen, right? Third, you have to have some common customs and traditions. You can have that common language and the common heritage, but if your customs and traditions are just completely out of sync with the other group, you're never going to really foster that sense of nationalistic identity. Okay. Fourth, a common religion. If the religions are too vastly dissimilar, it actually can cause strife instead of a sense of commonality. Right. Now, in the case of these colonists, they do have a lot of different religions. We've talked about evangelicalism versus Anglicanism and uh, Puritanism and things like that, right? But ultimately, these things did have one thing in common in that they were all Christian religions, right? Um, and then finally, you need common territory, right? Obviously, you have to be in close proximity of each other. Um, you're never going to see a sense of nationalistic identity develop between Austria and Australia, the only things that put those two uh, nations close to each other is where they lie in the dictionary, and that's it. Okay, so if you have these five prerequisites, then if you have stressors, you can then develop a nationalistic sentiment, right? The first of these stressors would be a shared feeling of threat by some common uh, enemy, right? This is really important. You have to have some kind of similar threat. Now, in the case of these English colonists, that feeling of threat or oppression, that common enemy was the king and parliament. So that being uh, the case, they began to develop some kind of sense of, of, of commonality in their, in their plight, right? Which leads to the next step, the final critical step, and that is a living, active, corporate will to be a nation, okay? And ultimately, that threat from that common oppressor is going to become so strong that despite the fact that these colonies are so vastly different from each other and have a lot of reasons not to like each other, um, they will manage to find at least enough reason and enough a nationalistic identity to try and break the shackles of the English uh, crown and become a nation in and of themselves.